when you think about it, I think about the coaches that make an impact are the ones that actually get to know you, you know? Um, and, and so I, I, for the longest time, I couldn't figure out a way. How do you really describe that? Right. And it would have been the ones that I say, love tough. Um, you know, we hear the saying tough love, but I think if you reverse the order of those words, right. Um, love tough when they truly love you then they now have built up that trust to be tough on you sports science strength and conditioning high performance coaching welcome to the decoding excellence show today's episode is brought to you by vaud performance the makers of the nordboard If you haven't checked out their website yet, I highly suggest you head over there, whether it's return to play, injury prevention, or just plain performance testing, VOD Performance has the tools that you need. Check them out at vaudperformance.com. Today on the Decoding Excellence Show, I talk with Coach Greg Adamson from University of Tennessee. Greg has a fascinating story, and we explore his pathway into coaching uh, from a graduate assistant at Central Michigan University to finding a position at Winthrop to his eventual uh, and current position at University of Tennessee. We discuss everything from education, empowerment of student athletes and building adaptability. We dive deep into utilization of technologies and wearable devices into current training, uh, both on catapult sports devices and discussing the latest acquisition with Whoop and how they're using that piece of performance technology. We discuss books and some of the favorite books that we both are reading uh, and some of the best books that we read during 2016. This is a wide ranging conversation. You do not want to miss this episode. I thoroughly enjoyed my time with Coach Greg Adamson, and you will be a better coach from listening to this. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Coach Greg Adamson. Coach, welcome to the show. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Hey, man, I am am certainly excited to have you on your materials. I know we've gone back and forth on social uh, media and Twitter for what is uh, damn near feels like a year kind of uh, just sharing and retweeting. And so it's been finally great to to connect with you and get you on the Decoding Excellence show. How are things with you? Things are going real well. I'm busy over here on Rocky Top. There's no question about that. We uh Got a lot of projects going on, and most importantly, we've got some amazing student athletes we get to work with every day. I've been looking forward to having this interview and just sharing a conversation with you um, that I, I know we're going to discuss a lot of great topics throughout the day today. But more importantly, I, uh, I'd love to explore your journey into coaching and just provide the listening audience with a background about how you currently got to your role and maybe the steps along your coaching pathway that led you to where you're at today. Yeah, no doubt. Um, initially, uh, was an intern and coached high school when I was, uh, undergrad at Winthrop university, coached at Rock Hill high school. Um, that was my first couple different sports. I ran, ran uh, baseball there, worked with football. Um, uh, you know, and it was an awesome time and then went on GA to central Michigan had a blast, spent two years up there. I uh, got married and my wife moved from South Carolina to central Michigan and said, no go. Went back to uh, Charlotte. She's a registered dietitian, was a fitness consultant for a company and uh, wanted to get back to college coaching and actually turned out a job at another place to, so we could be together. Was coaching first grade basketball and interning again. And then luckily, you know, one of my good friends was assistant at Winthrop where I'd gone to school, got the head job at NKU and, uh, It was just a quick quick fit. I think I was in that role within about 48 hours. Um, So no need to have two weeks or anything like that. And spent a couple years there, enjoyed my time, loved the area. Obviously, I went to school there. My wife went there. Um, I got the chance to come to Tennessee initially with football from my old director from Central Michigan in January of 2013. I started at the University of Tennessee. And since I've been here, my role has been kind of all over the place, man. I've been playing six man for a while, I guess you could say, uh, build in utility, any which way you look at it, work with football, uh, been fortunate enough to work with soccer, swim, men's and women's rowing, overseeing GPS for a season for football, overseeing it for soccer. Um, we've done different things, oversee our whoop initiative that we do with our student athletes. So different aspects, uh, been really involved with. And so that's kind of been my journey. 
Um, you know, and I got into all of it because I had, it's funny, I had three major knee surgeries in high school. And, uh, you know, I don't know if I was, you know, looking back at it, I look at all this push for high school strength and conditioning, what I wish it was, how cool it must be to go to high school now and have a strength coach and have somebody that's got a background and a passion to want to help you on your way. Um, I remember we would all just do, okay, so-and-so is going to sign. I remember, I think the big one for us was Ole Miss. Okay. He's going to Ole Miss. Let's all do the summer program. You know, uh, no such thing though, as a movement efficiency. We didn't talk about movement quality, you know, and I look back at it now and go, you know, the way the body works. I love this side, the performance side and not a good athlete. I would tell you that and just a hard worker. And so it's just a good fit. Enjoy it. Um, I think the fact that I've had to work really hard to learn the different things and different movements and techniques has made me a better coach. You know, I think you got a, a cool trajectory and pathway from just moving and having that sort of graduate assistant experience at CMU and then kind of serendipitously falling into interning and, and becoming an assistant at Winthrop and then moving on to, uh, to Tennessee. I, uh, I'd love to kind of explore a little bit. I know it's this is going to be a kind of a wide ranging conversation, but I'd love to maybe explore a little bit deeper. Um, when you made that first transition from going from CMU and back to Winthrop, uh, what I mean, what were you thinking? You know, from now you're no longer an intern, you're no longer a graduate assistant, you're interning there and accepting that first job that first responsibilities of of actually like this isn't you know the the training wheels are coming off you're now an assistant this isn't just an internship what what were you thinking what were you feeling what was that conversation that you're having with yourself during that time you know it's funny you know at that time you know i really wanted to just kind of push kids physically and psychologically you know and that's all that's all i fell back to uh you know, and, and I was very raw, you know, I, I, my gift was being able to teach, uh, you know, and, and so it hits you quick though. You know, I think, uh, luckily the assistant, uh, very good friend of mine, he's the, the head strength coach at Northern Kentucky university, Brian Booz. And, uh, you know, he was a great mentor, uh, you know, shared everything. He did something that you don't always see left me everything he had done for a couple of years. Oh, wow. You know, um, and, and it's something that I then did for, you know, who followed me, you know, and wanted to repeat that path just because you want to do right by the kids. Right. Um, and to do right, you need to know what has been done oftentimes. And so you want that person to succeed behind you. Um, if you truly cared about the well being of the kids, you know, if it's, if you remove that pride. And so I think that was huge. Uh, but yeah, it was definitely that first year was definitely a lot of learning a lot of experiences you know uh you know it's full circle the best way i can explain it we have a girl that came here as a graduate transfer on women's basketball i don't work with women's basketball here at winthrop i did and i had her as a as a freshman you know five years later she's here as a graduate transfer and uh you know i <laughs> she comes here and i love her to death you know and she's worked with all these strength coaches and uh i was with a different coach and they asked her them to describe me she goes passionate crazy and tough, you know, and I was like, yeah, I guess, you know, and it was just when I trained her five years ago, I, you know, I started thinking back five, six years. I'm like, what was I doing? <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I was just making them work, you know. Um, and, and so I think that's where it's really you really start to progress when you are an assistant and you have to answer to the head coaches. I think your progression and your ownership of what you're prescribing for these kids really starts to take a hold, um, you know, and, and it's, you know, I think too, it's definitely one of those things, uh, for that year in between, I turned down a job to go be with my wife. She moved up to central Michigan for me. So I guess I could move, you know, move back to Charlotte. I say that sarcastically. Um, Charlotte's a lot nicer in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. <laughs> and, uh, but in that, that, that down year, I love to coach, you know, I could get out of coaching tomorrow. I could get fired tomorrow and I'm coaching. Right. And so, uh, a buddy of mine, a professional runner, I trained, we were coaching a first grade, second grade basketball league. And this is the team that nobody wanted to, didn't have a parent step up, you know, so we're coaching this, uh, church league basketball. Right. And, uh, you just never know. One of the dads was good friends with Joe Kent, you know, and that was just another bridge. And so, 
you know, I think to young coaches, sometimes you think, and so that, that led to a relationship with Joe, you know, and coach Cannon is one of those things. Sometimes kids don't realize, you know, younger interns and GAs and stuff that when you're coaching, good things are going to happen. You know, it doesn't matter the level. If you love it, you're going to do it. And I still resort back to that basketball team. I mean, I, I tell people all the time, that's probably my best coaching job to date. Um, we went from losing five straight to winning six straight, you know, uh, change the culture of a seven-year-old. That's a, that's a battle in itself. Right. And so I, I, I think that that's one thing that if I can, if I'm passionate about it, it's, it doesn't matter where you're at. It matters whether or not you freaking love the coach, teach, and just love on these kids. Love tough is what I say. To bridge on top of that, because I think there's a couple, couple anecdotes in there that really resonate for me. But if you were to kind of explore a little bit deeper, what, how did you become interested, like in that empowerment and that teaching? I mean, was it a, you know, like a parent? Was it the sort of the way that you were raised? Was it you know a coach, a mentor, someone in your life that got you passionate in sharing? that that love of teaching and education with other athletes i I'd, I'd love for you to explore that for a little bit yeah no doubt you know i think uh my dad was a huge influence on me growing up it's funny i've got my son's three and a half i've got two kids three and a half and my daughter's one and my mom was saying i never read anything but the sports page you know so i grew up just loving sports and you know my dad coached me when i was young and i remember you know, he'd bring candy bars for everybody else while I'm having to run laps for something, you know. <laughs> and uh, and so I think there was that love right there. Um, I think at one point in my growing up, we moved all around the country. So at one point I did five schools in five years. Right. And so good, bad or indifferent. I saw some good youth coaching and some bad youth coaching, uh, you know. And, and so I knew there was a desire in me to want to kind of change that a little bit. And so when I went to Winthrop, it's a teaching school. Um, it's a school based around just education. And so there was a professor there, Dr. Wilson. She did an unbelievable job. And, you know, I, initially I was doing the phys ed track and I took her coaching class. It was a grad class, took it as a sophomore. And she let me in it. And it just it absolutely opened my eyes to, man, like as a coach, you should have a mission statement. As a coach, you should lesson plan. You know, these are things that I necessarily hadn't seen. And, and so I think there's just that innate desire in me to to want to believe in kids, you know, uh, because it wasn't necessarily all there for myself, you know. And, and I think it's funny, you know, I don't blog. I'm working on my first blog ever. Um, I've been working on it for eight months. It's in my head. I just got to write it uh, about, you know, three fifths of the way done. But one of the points I want to talk about is everybody talks about these kids being entitled and it's entitled kids. And I think sometimes you can see entitled coaches, you know, um, whether, it, it, and I have a hard time sometimes. I'm like, Hey, John Wooden, the best coach in my opinion of all time passed away in a little town home, right? Uh, the best to ever do it was humble meek. I mean, but he was tough, but it was one of those things. He just loved what he did, you know? And, and nowadays it's so blown out, you know, it's so big and it's so different. Um, and so, and it took him so long to perfect his craft, but I just think sometimes it's funny, like you can look at it and I remember being young, you see what some of these directors make and some of these schools, you see the salaries, you see the contracts and, and if that's what you're in it for, you're going to be, uh, really let down at some point, you know, uh, because, you know, if you start with the end in mind, and that's kind of Dr. Wilson, she kind of really drilled that into that class. It hit me, you know, you're going to pass away one day. There's going to be athletes at your funeral. And the question is, is, you know, are they happy you're gone or are they sitting there talking about how you've impacted them? You know, and Billy Graham talks about a coachal impact, you know, an athlete more than anybody else could ever do it. You know, and so I think there's just kind of that relationship, you know, and I, I'd, I'd had some good coaches and I'd had some coaches, like I said, that maybe could have been a little bit better in some areas, you know, growing up. So that was kind of it. Uh, and so and then once you. And every coach knows this, but when you see a kid get it, you see them become better and they invite you to their wedding or you're in their wedding and you're just taking a step back and you're sitting there and you see that next process of their life. Uh, there's nothing cooler, you know, um, there's no better feeling. And so I think that, you know, that's just kind of where it's at, you know, and 
I, like I said, I get out of here tomorrow. I'm going to go coach middle school or something. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, on, on top of that, you talked about entitlement and I think you see it and it's, it, I think it's pervasive certainly in, uh, not only our own strength conditioning industry, but just, you know, societal sort of swings that, uh, you know, people are getting into whatever profession, whatever pursuit that they're doing for the wrong reasons. And I think if you are truly passionate about leaving an impact and being a positive mentor and role model for what is otherwise the, the youth population that we serve, then, you know, you're approaching it from the right reasons, like, you know, Coach Wooden and, and having that sort of modest and humble and and uh, uh, removing that ego aspect of, of coaching and doing it for the right reasons. I'd love to, when you said that you were, you moved a lot in your youth and you were five schools, you know, and traveling quite a bit, you talked about having different coaches and some that shaped you positively and maybe some, uh, now that you look back upon your coaching sort of legacy and years in it. And you said, well, you know, maybe there were some coaches that did some things poorly or did some things wrong. If you could juxtapose those two against each other, what what are the qualities that the good coaches possess that did that was different from maybe what um, the, you know, the poor coaches did? I mean, was there specific, you know, memories or anything that resonates? Was it the way, the demeanor, the attitudes, the the, the structure, I'd love for you to look at that a little bit and maybe um, try to come to some conclusions. Yeah, man. Great question. Yeah. You know, I think uh, when you think about it, I think about the coaches that make an impact are the ones that actually get to know you, you know. Um, and, and so I, I for the longest time, I couldn't figure out a way. How do you really describe that? Right. And it would have been the ones that I say love tough. Um, you know, we hear the saying tough love. But I think if you reverse the order of those words, right, um, love tough, when they truly love you, then they now have built up that trust to be tough on you, you know. And so another thing, too, is I'm not big on, you know, I, I think at a young age, you need to be careful with your belittlement of uh, athletes, um, you know, and that's one of those things that you see it, you know, and, and I'm, I'm just one of those people. I don't I don't like to tolerate that. I don't like to see it. And so I think. Uh, you know, how are you trying to, you know, motivate, you know, what's the conversation about? And so I think, you know, sometimes it's, it's really easy to fall back on fear, uh, you know, because it's just, you can resort to it and it works, but it only works for so long. And, and we know that. And so I think that's one of those things that that's the challenge of it all, you know, is how do you, how do you, tap into that intrinsic motivation It's those coaches that make you think, okay, man, how can I be better? I didn't know I could do that. I didn't know I could believe in myself, you know? And, and even now it's funny. There's a guy out there named Franco Wakisi, you know, and he, he's a training partner of mine and he's from uh, Kenya. He served in the militia there, played soccer at Winthrop. We're real close friends and we're training to run this ultra marathon, you know, and, uh, and I'm a terrible runner. I got bad knees. Right. And I just, want to do something, you know, you try and do different things that just push yourself. And, uh, even now, like, man, he just, he gets me believing I can get a run in or I can get this done, you know? And so, but it's cause he knows and believes in what I I'm capable of, you know? And so I think sometimes that, that line is something you got to walk, you know? And, and, and I think you got to watch your language, your demeanor, all these things that we know. Um, uh, but I, I think you have kids, right? Yeah, yeah, I got a uh, four-year-old daughter who uh, is four going on 13 and uh, a one-year-old awesome. son. So our kids are about the same age and, and uh, you know, our ta- you know, our threes and fours, you know, they, they show us so much. And, and one of the things is, is when they're frustrated, they immediately resort to, you know, Kayla, my son, just will resort to either snapping back or going into a shell, right? Uh, and And so I think that's, you know, attitude reflects leadership, right? So there, there's that, you know, I remember we all watched Remember the Titans back in the day, but that attitude reflects leadership. And, you know, I think that's the thing. That's our challenge is, is can we change that mindset, right? Um, when we can't do a problem, we can't fix it. Like, how do we go about that? And it's funny, I just actually accidentally said the word can. I've tried to outlaw that for myself and my family. And, you know, I posted a thing on Facebook the other night of my son, 
he said he couldn't, you know, he's like, I can't turn the light off. You know, I'm like, buddy, you can just problem solve. How do you go about it? You know, and let's not use that word. And, and so I think that's the other thing too, is just when coaches fall back on just to immediately to screaming and yelling, I wonder how much they really invested in their lesson plan of the day. Right. Did they draw out what they wanted to, what was the objective? Um, you know, because that's going to tell you a lot about how much they're really invested, you know? Uh, and so that's one of those things that you got to account for those type of things and those type of conversations. But what we can't do, I, I got to keep saying it. What we shouldn't do, right. Is uh, fall back to that. And so I hope that kind of answers it. I know I went a little bit off on a tangent, but look, this, this whole show is in a, is sort of like a public sort of exploration of, uh, of our coaching pathway. So there's no wrong path. And I think, you know, when you, when you talked about like attitudes reflect leadership and that ability of learning to navigate, do I go in a show or do I confront the issue? It, for me, it, it very much sort of parallels like Carol Dweck's work and mindset and learned helplessness. Like what are we teaching? How are we impacting our, our student athletes to either embrace a challenge whether it's a light switch, whether it's a, a sprint, or whether it's a defensive stop in whatever sport, whatever vehicle that we're using to drive this sort of behavior change, it's really ultimately comes down to the mindset. And again, you know, the attitudes reflect the leadership. And if, as we as mentors, we should be demonstrating and reflecting the characteristics and the behaviors that we want to see in the student athletes that we work with. Um, you t I, I love that the piece about not just tough love, but love tough, because I do think that so much of it is uh, is built upon the relationship and the sort of the uh, permission that an athlete gives you to push them, to challenge them, to motivate them, to encourage them. And I think that is built on relationships. And I'd love to sort of dive into the positive relationships that you've had and maybe some of the lessons you've learned and the, the pitfalls that you have learned to avoid as you've navigated from CM, CMU to Winthrop to, to now Tennessee. Are there, if you were to look back as far as like positive mentors in your life, whether it's a father or a mother or um, a coach, you know, someone completely outside of sport. And I, I've, the more conversations I've had, the more I've, I've learned that, you know, great mentors can be academics. They can be people completely unrelated to sport. Are there any sort of particular people in your life that really resonate that shaped your pathway into coaching, education, empowerment, adaptability, uh, that you continue to spread that message that's, that's led you to where you're at today? So many, you know, uh, you know, I think it's one of the things I approach every uh, relationship with. I'm going to learn something, you know, from uh, whoever I'm in, a, you know, a friendship with or mentor, et cetera. You know, so my father, but I had a professor as well. Dr. Mumford, he's at CMU now. He was a former coach that is in the sport administration program. He was a great mentor for me. Um, definitely challenged my thought process. Um, some great people up there, some, some coaches. You know, it's funny. So Maganos was the women's soccer coach. We became very close, and uh, he's now at Mississippi State. Uh, just got hired there, so it'll be fun playing against him because I know what he's about, but he was a good mentor. Uh, you know, and then from there on out, just so many coaches. Marlene Stallings, women's basketball coach in Minnesota, a dear mentor and friend. And, uh, you know, and, and it's just funny. You look at it, and you grow. And, and here, uh, you know, right now we hired Rock, our director, and he's been – phenomenal um he's done an unbelievable job our associate Mike Sertian's a great mentor of mine to me uh our swim coach Matt Kredich uh Matt Kredich is in my opinion one of the best minds in coaching hands down no matter the sport you know and Brian Penske our women's soccer coach I mean there's just so many people that kind of formulate as you grow you know you mentioned the book mindset you know I I love that that growth-based mindset and so it's you're always learning. I think the biggest thing is, though, is I love to be around people um, that don't see obstacles. You know, they don't talk about problems. They talk about solutions and doing things that haven't been done. You know, those are 
those are the people that are going to be enthusiastic, right? Because you got to have a little bit of enthusiasm, you know, to be crazy, you know, and try and accomplish things um, and see things differently and challenge the status quo. And so I love being around those type of people. Um, and so, you know, I think that's just kind of where we're at from that. Um, you know, I love being around people that love to read. Um, if I have a conversation with you and you don't reference a book, start to wonder, you know, I, I uh, leaders are readers. I know it seems simple to say it like that, but it's the absolute truth. And so um, there's a lot to be said about reading and just enjoying wisdom that's already been laid out. And so it's kind of where we're at right now. You know, the field. Yeah. Is that yeah. within at Kansas now? Um, close friend and unbelievable mentor of mine. Really uh, somebody I trust tremendously. Um, the guy is heart is in the right reasons. You know, there was, I was so ecstatic for him when he was in our at Southern Miss just for our profession, because it's funny. I had the conversation with some administrators at a different school that I know, and they were just talking about what is, you know, what does his strength coach know about running an athletic department, you know? And my response was, well, is it any different than somebody that has a background in uh, marketing compliance or fundraising? Uh, well, like he's worked with multiple teams. He's worked with a student athlete. He's proven to put that he's going to put them first. Um, he, he's balanced the budget. You know, he's made thought out, deliberate decisions. Uh, you know, and so I think that was huge for our profession is as the athletics, as they see us, they don't just see us as, oh, hey, that's just a meathead guy or whatever that might entitle. Right. You know, and sometimes it's their own inferiority that they want to throw that down. You know, they don't necessarily want to work on themselves and, and that's what it could be. So, I mean, I think that as well has been big, you know, and there's a lot of high school coaches. Evan Bryant is a coach in Georgia. He's a close friend. He's a mentor of mine. And so, man, the list could go on forever, man. I, uh, you know, there's a couple things in there that I think is, is important to, um, recognize. And that's obviously, I, I love the, the pack, the, the fact about just the requirement to continue to advance and think outside the box and to challenge mediocrity and the status quo. And I think that's, that's necessary in, in not only our field, but every field. If you, if you want to be an innovator and you want to leave a legacy and you want to do things greater than they've ever been done before, then it's required to really challenge yourself and stretch yourself and stretch your organization to think big and not just uh, marginal gains, not just a small percentage of gains, but to, to 10x your own organization the way that you're doing things. And uh, the fact that we can capture so much wisdom in, you know, two, 300 pages of a book, I, it's, it blows my mind when I talk to people that uh, don't read because of the time commitment to sit down. I mean, with the technology of audiobooks and e-readers and, and a physical book, I mean, it's you know, people will spend their entire life uh, in, you know, economics and then at the end write their memoir and write down everything they've learned in their 60, 80, 90 year life in a book that you can then amass <laughs> oh. their knowledge in, in a weekend. It blows my mind that, you know, like that's the best vehicle, I think, sometimes to learn how interconnected all of our disciplines are. And since you set the scene uh, for that, I'd love and not not necessarily I don't need to know the one book or whatever but what are what are some of the the some books that you have found instrumental in your coaching career or you know whether it's communication or the actual training X's and O's or business management or leadership development or even even as far as saying you know, I've coached on the floor from 6 to 6. I just want to go home. I want to read something that gets my mind out of it but challenges your thinking in sort of a fiction standpoint. I'd love to, I'd love to dive into what you love to read and what's really resonated with you. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, you know, it's funny. I love anything by John Wooden or about, I mean, anything about John Wooden, any biography I have, I think probably eight books that got Wooden somehow on the cover. Right. Um, big fan, you know, uh, ego is the enemy by Ryan holiday. Uh, Love that book. Love the concept. Um, you know, I think that's it's funny. There's two books that he's written, Obstacle is the Way and Ego is the Enemy. And, you know, I'm hooked on both. 
um, just the thought processes and the way he lays it out and studies people throughout time. Um, I'm a big fan. I read uh, Wild at Heart by John Eldridge, big fan of that. Um, just what it means to be a man, what it means to be a father, husband. Um, it, <laughs> you know, and it's from a training perspective, you know, I'm always reading something, you know, and I think it's, you know, it's funny. I look at it, you know, right now, I'm, I just finished sport analytics, uh, but, you know, I enjoy just different people putting stuff out there, you know, like Cal Dietz with Trivasic Training. So many of us fall back to it. I love, you know, Vern Gambetta. I, don't, I didn't mention him before, but he's a huge mentor of mine, uh, someone that I've become very close with. And anything he puts out, love to read, love to think about it, love his uh, – Love his want to challenge the status quo. I think he does a great job of that. Love his common sense. Uh, you know, and so I read a book that might seem simple. Recently read Soccer Anatomy. Pretty fun. You know, just kind of thought like, I don't know if it's out there, but for each sport, there should be a book, just anatomy, right? Uh, recently, read it, re- recently read a book, Swim Fast. And so, I mean, I'm always reading, you know, and I guess what I'm reading at that time is probably what I'm going to resort to to talk about. And I think that's the importance of consistently evolving our mind. Um, but the books that I come back to, you know, and then I love the Bible, of course, uh, whether or not you're a Christian. I mean, it's still a lot of a lot you could take from diving into that um, and just leadership and from a standpoint of things and society, you know, and how things haven't really changed over you know, ever so many years. Um, but I love John Gordon. Um, easy reads, great stuff to recommend to kids. Um, you know, and that's one thing too, is I, you know, I, I really challenge my kids to read, uh, you know, I, I mean, my, my personal kids, but the kids I'm blessed to coach, you know, and really try and get them to think, you know, cause if they read a book that you recommend and they start reading it, I know you got them right. Kid in today's world, it's going to take the time to read. Now they're really thinking, you know? And so, um, uh, it's pretty cool, you know, and so that's kind of where we're at. You know, I, I would recommend, though, every coach out there, ego is the enemy. Um, you know, I, I love all the books, you know, from good to great, you know, and those are all awesome as well. Tipping point. I mean, just we could all go on and on, right? Yeah. Um, I'm getting ready to dig into extreme ownership. I've listened to it. Um, now I'm going to try and read it, you know, and I think, you know, I listen to a lot of books on Audible, big Audible fan. So, and then if we want to go the other route, right, if you just want to read for fun, Vince Flynn, Mitch Rapp, uh, best series, I think, out there. Um, Mitch Rapp is just the CIA spy. You know, Vince Flynn is the author, actually passed away. They have a new author doing the series, but it's a best-selling series, and the audio books are amazing, you know. So if I'm just trying to just kind of listen, um, and what I love about it is, yeah, you know, although it's, you know, not necessarily 100 percent true, even though the author got in trouble at one point for being too close to what goes on. Uh, what's, what I love is just the, the outside the box thinking right uh, on the spot. How do we think through this? How do we do it a little differently? So there's something to take from everything, you know. Uh, and so I hope that answers that question. No. Yeah, it does. Um, you know, I, and to go along with that, I think you, you mentioned obviously and let off with Wooden and it reminded me of uh, Practice Perfect by Doug Lamov, who's an educator. Uh, he had uh, Teach Like a Champion was another book, both excellent uh, materials, especially when so much of our professions about pedagogy and, and structure of design of what we do and, you know, borrowing from the educational system and to be educators essentially of strength and conditioning and how to move and how to how to learn these behaviors are, are tremendous tomes. I completely agree with you with Ryan Holiday. I think uh, those both those books are sorely needed in our profession, um, which seems rampant with uh, ego egocentric sort of uh, philosophies and principles. So I think that's great. Our, uh, you know, you talked about you know earlier in, in this uh, in this show about crafting your own personal coaching philosophy and a book that was so instrumental and I try to reread is uh Pete Carroll's Win Forever. That's next for was, me. Yeah. That's that I mean that for me uh that sort of changed my narrative that I had as far as coaching for the right reasons. I remember reading that in grad school long ago and 
and uh, and really sitting down and saying, why do I coach and what do I want out of coaching? And I think is is uh, is super uh, uh, necessary for us uh, in our craft. And then uh, I, you know, like I've been trying to read a little bit more um, fiction, but uh, I, I would say my my best read, perhaps of 2017, if it isn't Ryan's Daily Stoic, which is sort of like a uh, a replacement for the Bible as it's crafting from different Stoics yeah. um, and, and meditation. And as far as like uh, uh, meditations from Marcus Aurelius and, and just some lifelong lessons that applies in a lot of different situations, the best sort of uh, nonfiction, the gene so much because of uh, our involvement in trying to optimize and, and, and help shape athletes to their genetic potential Having a uh, it's it's the gene and intimate history. I'm going to butcher um, the uh, author's name. I think it's like Siddhartha. Uh, I'm not even going to try Amazon.com. Check it out. But he also he also wrote a yeah. It is it is thick, man. It is thick. 592 pages. It's also available on Audible. Um, but it dives deep into the exploration of how we discovered the gene and Darwinism and evolution and, and the whole process, the scientific experiments with um, the pea pods. It's, it's a tremendous read if you are interested in the historical sort of evolution of our understanding of science and the genetic code. Um, really fascinating read and one that I recommend. Probably my best book of uh, actually of 2016 um, now that I've nerded out a little bit about books no, no, and another, reading, another which is, mentor, uh, Adam smothered me. He's assistant coach at Clemson. He's a rock star of a coach. Right. And he's the one that told me to win, to, to read win forever by Pete Carroll. And one of my life philosophies is if two people I respect say the same book, I got to read it. I just always go with yeah, that. If yeah. two people, so you're the second person. So now it's like, I'm kicking myself that I haven't read it yet. Right. Um, uh, that's and that's hard. I mean, like, there's so many. There's people that that we respect, and everybody has their own flair of what resonates to them, and and you know, books that call out to them. Um, some books resonate more. You know, there's been books. I'm trying to think of some popular books that people love, and that I I read it, and I'm like, ah, oh, man, you know, it's it didn't really call to me. But and then you pick it up three, four, five years later, and it hits you right. And it's just this idea of like being at the right place at the right time, and. Uh, and there's books. I mean, like you referenced the Bible. I mean, you can read things over and over and different passages, different chapters, different books will hit you at a different place in life. You know, like you talked about being, you know, so training heavy earlier in your career and now being on the edge or other other side of it and the importance of empowerment and education in student athletes. Um, not to say that training isn't important, but just there's there's differences and progressions that we go through within our professional career that I think is uh, is important, just like a good book or just like a good passage. Um, I'd like to uh, I'd, I'd like to maybe change kind of the where the conversation's going. So we know that you can sell out rock star arenas and you can play the hits, and that's the the show is obviously you know it's not technically driven it's not you know as far as what we do uh, the x's and the o's and let's talk about velocity based training and and xxx and of of different sort of uh things but so we spent the first perhaps half of the show sort of understanding who you are and getting a glimpse behind the curtain that is you i'd like to uh i'd like to talk about present day modern day uh coaching and what you're currently up to at at tennessee as far as what you're teaching and how perhaps you're teaching your athletes about education and empowerment, this adaptability in your student athletes. I browse, I, I use you as a resource so much on social media, on Twitter, and I, I see the pictures of your athletes training. And not only is the methodology rock solid, and I know you have a, a scientific approach and we can talk about technology yeah. here uh, down the road, but I just would like 
for you to talk maybe a little bit about the intangibles of the relationships, the, the, the empowerment and maybe like yeah. the, the how of what you do with your student athletes that's, that's led you to this position and this kind of thought process of this larger scope, this larger importance of the vehicle of strength conditioning and what we're teaching our athletes. Yeah, no doubt. You know, it's fun, man. It's one of those things. Uh, I got a couple different philosophies, you could say, that have kind of evolved over time. You know, when you talk about Twitter, I'm only on Twitter. I'm not on Instagram. And Facebook is more for, you know, family, right? Um, and so I figured I got to do one form of social media and do it correctly, do it right, really reach the kids. Snapchat scares me, right? I'm not about to involve in that. And then I've only got so much time. Uh, and so I sold out on Twitter. Uh, and I tell people all the time, the second my kids quit commenting and favoriting and retweeting, I'm out, right? The second they stop paying attention, I'm out. Uh, but I have a five to one. I don't put anything on Twitter unless I have hit five personal texts to an athlete. And so it's funny, like some days you'll see me just not put anything out and stuff. And partially it's because I'm busy, but I want to make sure I'm building that individual relationship before I worry about you know, what the outside world sees, right? Uh, you know, and so I think that's a big part. Um, you know, I think uh, one of the best things I ever started was 90 Seconds of Why. I realized I was watching TV one night with my wife, and I'm sitting there, and I'm just like, these kids have grown up their whole life only knowing commercials, right? They don't know VHS. They don't know Rewind. They know Hulu, and most of them only know maybe a commercial at the start of Hulu, right? Uh, and so their attention span, and we all know this and we read about it. So once a week, I like to take a topic and it could be anything, right? Like, why do we squat? Why do we hang clean to um, conditioning, to something physically, to an agility drill? It could be specific. You know, one time we did Batman versus Superman, you know, um, but 90 seconds of why we do what we do and why we believe it. Right. And that's the best thing I've ever done, because I think this generation, they have education everywhere. Um, and, you know, I. At one point, I wanted to go back and do my Ph.D., and so I took a class here, and with two kids, it's not happening right now, right? Um, it's going to happen, but uh, I'm sitting in class, and it's different when you when you when you go back to class and you're in your 30s as opposed to when you're 22, 23, 24, and I'm sitting there, <laughs> and I'm having a hard time with the professor because she's just regurgitating PowerPoints, PowerPoints that have probably been supplied to her by the book company, you know, and Business Insider wrote an article, PowerPoint should be outlawed at universities. And then we had this guest speaker come in. He did everything on the whiteboard. And I'm like, that's it. I got to get up for 90 seconds in front of my kids and put it on the whiteboard. And then if I don't know what they ask, I got to say, I don't know and own it. Right. And, uh, and so that's kind of where I think a lot of the relationship and trust come from is they know I'm going to be honest with them and they know I'm going to care about them. And so when you care about somebody, you're honest with them. And so, um, that's, that's the biggest thing, man. I, I think it's fun. I love to see them get excited about it. I love to see them getting uh, favoring, retweeting. You know, uh, it's funny. Our swim group, we have a group going to NCAAs. Uh, women go next week. Men will go the week after. Kids that don't go. We call them uh, our 2018 group, right? You know, um, they're going to go next year rather than the kids that didn't go. You know, that's kind of disrespectful. Um, and so, you know, we've been getting up at 6 a.m., and kind of doing some different things, fish out of water, so to speak, right? Doing some different type of training because it's the time of the year where we can have a little bit of fun. Um, and so, I mean, it's been pretty tough on last Friday. We actually ran out at our football stadium. We ran a big gate, you know, it's gate 10. It's a huge hill and uh, it's pretty cool. But so I told him this Friday, you know, be ready. You don't know where we're going. Uh, make sure you got running shoes. Make sure you're dressed warm. It's 530. I'm like, hey, meet me at the Waffle House. You know, the only question I got is steak and eggs or waffles. What do you eat? You know, and, uh, <laughs> You know, and it was awesome to watch them come out and just get excited about it. And so I think that's kind of the other part about it, too, is, you know, we need to have a pulse on our teams. And so, uh, you know, and, and so that's kind of my role here. Um, you know, I work directly with women's soccer, rowing, and then men's and women's swimming. And uh, I kind of over time, you know, and we have a new AD, and I think some things could maybe um, – We'll see what it looks like, you know, um, within our strength conditioning department. Um, right now, we're in a great place, though. You know, we we have Rock Gill because he's leading the department, doing a great job. And but I've kind of overseen over time the applied performance aspects of certain sports and certain things. And 
you know, what's funny to me is I'd be reminiscent. I want to talk a little bit about technology because I think I have become a little bit of passionate about trying to challenge the status quo. And it is that's where I've made the most mistakes. Um, 2013, I'm working with football. We're using 50 polar heart rate monitors and we had zero buy in from our kids. Right. And our coaches, the buy in for them was selfish, you know. Yeah. Um, and so we progress, you know, over time and to that, you know, and it was just a lot of work. And, you know, I spoke for Polo at the National Conference a few years back and, you know, I didn't do the job of speaking. I wanted to, but uh, at the time I wasn't allowed to present any outside data. Right. And that's OK. And, and that's that's a rule I was under. Um, and so it was kind of tough <laughs> to present on that and just talk about. And I remember walking away from that thinking, man, like we've got to do a better job. Yeah. Most importantly, I've got to do a better job of getting these kids to understand why and so i think that's kind of you know talking about books you know we've all talked about you know the power of why and what's your why you know and I actually ask when we how, we have these coaching system positions my first question is always what's your why you know give me a why statement and and, and so i started that's kind of when i started asking myself why are we doing it like why and, and i think that's when you really start to see that growth you start challenging your own thought your own process and so um we went from that to gps and you know, we no longer at this time are using polar heart rate monitors and we could go back to it. Right. They have a shirt now. Uh, but it's funny. I could talk about, you know, some of the different things I've seen with that. Um, we actually utilize whoop now uh, with a lot of our athletes. And, and so long story short, you know, I'll be curious to see what our profession looks like in five to ten years, because I think anybody has the model figured out. You know, um, you know, I've talked to a couple of our administrators and we talked about what's it going to look like. Right. Like, what do we you know, how do we move forward? Um, you know, I told you it's been really busy. We're building a brand new weight room and we're going to put a sports science lab in it. Right. I don't know. And we don't know 100 percent of what that's going to look like. And, and we're trying to be very deliberate. Um, we have a donor, the Carmichael family. So it'll be the Carmichael Sports Science Lab. And we're ecstatic. They're behind it. Right. And, um but it's just curious, you know, it's just interesting. So one of the best things that's happened for me here is there's a guy named Brad Roll, been, been in the NFL 20 years, head guy, four different teams. He worked with Dwayne Johnson. He was at the U back in the late eighties, you know? Uh, and so he's our intern, makes 12 bucks an hour, right? Uh, 57, 58 years old, you know, uh, comes out to our soccer game sometimes and he runs GPS for football, which I used to do. And I, it just got to the point where there's just too much, right? There's only so many hours in a day. But he's been really good for me as well, just kind of how do we build this out and how do we go about doing it the right way? Because I think it's like anything. You want to challenge the status quo, but you also want to be very deliberate. Um, and so if you want to ask any questions about that, I'd love to dive into it. Yeah, man. I uh, Yeah, I think there's enough. And you, you spoke about it already when you said, you know, like, it's hard to predict what the future of strength conditioning and performance training looks like with the advent or at least the, the, the popularization of sports science infecting and coming into the field. And I, I, I look at it as such a positive uh, discipline to allow us to objectively audit the program design and, and what we do. You said it. You said it. Audit, man. Uh, it's funny. That's the word. Yeah, I think we need to. I mean, so much of our profession uh, has been kind of built on, you know, subjective opinions of what modalities are better than others. And we've we've had sports science, but now the the capabilities of equipping athletes with biometric measurement devices and IMUs and accelerometry and and, uh, GPS devices, they're getting cheaper and cheaper and smaller and smaller that it's becoming a, a. a, a, a accessible way of, of measuring the bio demands of each sport. And you, you alluded to it, you said it, um, but, uh, probably drawing reference from Simon Sinek, start with why, like as a sports scientist or applied sports scientist and a performance coach, we need to have the questions formulated uh, of understanding what sort of information do we start to collect that can lead us to a hypothesis about whatever we're trying to answer. And I think a lot of times right now in the profession is that we are keeping up with the Joneses per se to collect, 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 and assess, assess, assess that we've never taken the time to understand the why, what questions are we trying to solve within our own organization? 
what is, what is it we're trying to optimize? What is it we're trying to improve? And that leads us down to a slippery slope of collecting so much information that we have this paralysis by analysis of too many data points. Um, I, I'd be curious, I mean, like, and, and you said it, I mean, like, look, t- collecting GPS and, and sitting out there and, and getting IMAs and distances and velocities, it's it's a challenge to gather uh, information, A, just the collection of it, but then the interpretation, the assessment of it. How, how, are, you, uh, how are you balancing that? It's, I know it's a, a give and take, a relationship of gathering enough information but also making sense of the information to make actionable decisions. What's uh, what's your relationship with that? The biggest thing I've learned is do not go down that road when you're working with a team unless there's somebody on the sports staff willing to go down it with you. If they're not willing to get in the passenger seat or drive at times, it's not going to work, right? And I say that because it has to have actionable data. It has to be the data has to be actionable on whether it's the practice plan whether it's the individual athlete, et cetera, you're not going to be able to, when you work with multiple sports, be in every single staff meeting, right? Be up there when they're just kicking it and having conversation, right? And that's when a lot of things get talked about. Uh, And so I learned that, you know, from football, moving into it with soccer, we went to it, our goalies coach, you know, him and myself, we've just been driven, you know, conditioning something that's not talked about in our profession, you know, and I think it gets lost, you know, that it's important. And so we've tried to, we have this whole system on how we try to individualize our conditioning and it's been a road, you know, we've used the mass and certain things out there and, uh, but he's been, uh, he's been there with me every step of the way, you know, so we're two years into catapult with our soccer program and, you know, we're starting to look at, we're, we're starting to look at acute chronic, but I mean, when you talk about certain metrics, player load, our top three velocity bands and our meters per minute, our head coach to all the way down understands it's our athletic trainer, right? And so we can have some conversations about certain kids and positionally certain things. And then we have their game averages built in. And then we have those same conversations with the kids. And so, you know, I think it's it's one of those things It's funny, like it, you, you go into it initially and you want to talk like max velocity or overall distance. And those aren't bad things to talk about. Right. But you also got to go into it and, and ask your kids, what do they want to know? Uh, and so what I learned from football, when I got a chance to do it again, and in football now we actually utilize Zebra as well as Catapult. And so with Zebra, it's in their jersey, so we have every guy. Um, <laughs> right, wrong, or indifferent, we've got everybody in our indoor, and our indoor is wired out. So that's pretty cool um, that we're blessed to have that ability. Um, but with soccer, it was just we put the units by the cleats and made it part of their uniform. You know, I made it a mindset like that and made them feel, OK, hey, you guys are blessed to have this, you know. And so it's all about how you approach it. Um, it definitely does change how we do things in season, though. There's no question. And and this is what I don't think there's enough conversation on, you know, and, and I'm not a sports scientist and you'll never hear me describe myself as that. I like to apply performance mindset. I really love technology. I love the concept of audit, right? Um, you said that and I get so excited because it's like the thing that we need here next, in my opinion, is we need someone that's going to audit every day. Um, and I say that in, this, in the sense of that's what I think I think the model is going to go to is someone that has an analytical drive. Um, because when it comes to finances, right, um, you know, we need somebody to audit those, you know, whether it's your taxes, whether you're a company, right? They look at that. They don't necessarily tell you how to spend the money or where the money's going to go. It's your decision. You know, say your CEO, well, it needs to be in marketing or personnel. But you need to know where everything's at and what has and hasn't worked when you look at return on investment. Right. That's what we need to know, because we only get so much time. And with the new rules coming into effect in August, our time constraints are going to be even less. Um, you know, the NCAA passing that down and schedules are going to be more strict. And, and I'm all about it. Right. I'm not against the student athletes. I'm all for it. I love them taking ownership of their bodies, et cetera. But that means when you to me, time is your most expensive commodity. And so now if we have to take that time and put a price on it, time just went up. Right. If time is a stock, it just went up. We're going to have to now make sure we do more with it because it's more expensive for us to get. And I think that's something we need to keep in mind. And that's where a lot of this technology can come in. You know, if we can get them, you know, we use whoop and we do opt in, opt out. Right. It's the athlete's decision to use whoop. Um, and we have it on certain kids, you know, and we talk about the heart rate variability and 
the sleep, et cetera, but we leave it up to them. And, and so I think that's one of those things as well. You got to kind of look at. And so I think, and you mentioned a couple of different things. I mean, like, Granted, with Major League Baseball now, sort of uh, player association and the acceptance of uh, bi- wearable devices now, we're starting to see that as far as Whoop specifically be uh, with MLB and and uh, and using wearable technology as it starts to infiltrate its way into sport. And I love the opt in, opt out, and and especially you know like with something Whoop, our sort of continuous HRV yeah. and sleep, you know, like it's it's. I think that's important to balance that invasiveness, non-invasiveness aspects of it. But I look at something like yeah. catapult, like workload monitoring and and being able to gather player loads as just as important as a football helmet or a shoulder pads when it comes to prevention of injuries and, and the sort of auditing or the uh, balance of management of those workloads conducted during training sessions, practice and competitions. Yeah. Um, you know, it's uh, and you said it, and I think it's it's important to reiterate is that we are uh, we're at the point where we have so much different biometric information that we can collect. It's important to understand what each athlete wants to hear because it might be player load for your starting point guards. It might be IMAs for another athlete. It might be your velocities or distances covered for whatever, and I. I think it's you, you nailed it on the top of the head of shaping what's important to them to continue to build buy-in, but to already have that buy-in from the coaching staff because ultimately, you know, it's great to collect information on the back end to help in uh, influence and to understand what the demands of of the sport is so you can better prepare for it. But if you can't impact practice schedules and structures of what we're doing and and the the other 20 hours of the week, perhaps, you know, of skill training and, and their actual football practice or basketball practice, then, you know, a large majority of this technology can go unutilized or go yeah, for no nil. Um, yeah. I'd uh, so look, you and me, we, we share a same love affair of technology and and I, I think uh, we're going to keep or I got to keep that for part yeah, two, because I know you this, and I man. both can uh, we we can nerd out about, uh, you know, accelerometry yeah. data and information. And I'd love to yeah. explore how how you're using whoop yeah. and, and some of these uh, uh, sort of more wearable personal wearable devices, um, whether it's uh, I'm, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I'm, I mean, there's yeah, a number of know, different uh, bet it and whoop and uh uh, Misfits has some different wearables, and now that that the prosumer kind of that pro and consumer market devices are getting cheaper and cheaper. I mean, we're going to start to see this, and, and you know, I know the NCAA right now has sort of uh, 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 a one foot in, one foot out as uh, when it comes to the usage of wearable devices. But when utilized correctly by intelligent, smart training staff professionals. They are one of our most powerful weapons in understanding and the prevention of, of injuries. And if we truly care about athlete well-being, it's necessary. 100%. You, I mean, everything you just said, athlete well-being. Like, it's funny. I did an interview for Wall Street Journal a while back, and I don't know if it was ever published or not. But they wanted to talk about, is it wrong to look at an athlete when they're away from here, et cetera, right? Uh, and it's just funny that that was the thing that I kept going back to is now they're going to be a better mother, father, CEO, teacher, educator, whatever they go on to do, if they have a better understanding of the importance of sleep, right? And uh, their body and their way to recover. And so it's funny. Let's definitely, man, we got to we got to definitely set up part two. I think I think so. And I'd love to kind of get to invite you, invite you back on and have a, a like a roundtable technology discussion because. Uh, there's been similar conversations with people that utilize uh, different wearable devices and workload monitoring um, um, devices and companies and, and to talk analytics, to talk about how we use that on an applied standpoint to affect the day to day micro to mic uh, meso sort of uh, cycles of training would be fascinating to circle back around to kind of put a bow tie on this. Um, and because obviously it's decoding excellence show and we're getting at the heart of what 
what it is, the intangibles, the tactics, the tools, the techniques that go into what helps shape an excellent practice and excellent performance. And I think there are more commonalities than differences between the top of their class, whether it's chefs, artists, musicians, create uh, creatives, experienced Sil- Silicon Valley coders, whatever it is, and us coaches. When you think of excellence or mastery or the best at their craft, what what words, what what things, what pictures does that sort of manifest in you? What do you think of when you think of excellence? When I hear excellence, I think of two things. One, Steve Jobs once said, we don't get a chance to do many things and everyone should really be excellent because this is our life. Life is brief and, and then you die, you know? So this is what I've chosen to do with uh, my life, you know, and I, I piggyback that on to, OK, so we don't get chances. We don't get many opportunities. So every single project matters. And so now let's define what excellence is within the task, you know, and in the book Bounce, uh, the author, Michael, said excellence is about stepping outside the comfort zone, training with a spirit of endeavor, accepting the inevitability of trials and tribulations. Progress is built in effect upon the foundations of necessary failure. This is the essential paradox of expert performance. When these conditions are in place, learning takes off, knowledge escalates, and performance soars. You're on the path to excellence, you know. And so when I hear those two things and kind of mirror them together, you know, excellence to me is about persisting and resisting. You know, certain things you're going to have to resist, and then you're going to have to consistently persist. Um, And that's all it is. Get outside that comfort zone and look for that spirit of endeavor, you know, and see what type of trials, you know, you can go after. And tribulations you can kind of combat and see where it takes you perfect uh coach if someone was heading through knoxville or they're hundreds thousands of miles away listening to the show and had a question about something that that really resonated uh with them what's the best way that they can reach you two ways one twitter ut coach greg um greg g-r-e-g and then the second way i'm just going to give you my cell phone it's 803 389 zero zero six eight um you know i would say email but i get so many emails on a day-to-day basis that i usually don't get back to that till two to three days later um sometimes and so i think the best way to directly get me is text message or direct message i'm not on instagram uh you know i picked one social media and just said you know what i'm gonna kind of do well in this and be involved with that. And that was kind of Twitter, right, wrong, or indifferent. So those would be the two best ways. To reward the people that listen to the end of the show, they'll get their contact information. Coach, I just want to thank you for coming on the Decoding Excellence show. Um, I I took a lot away from this show. And uh, I know our talk on technology and your coaching background and for us to nerd out and, and talk books, um, there's just a lot of great quality uh, and nuggets in this show. So thanks so much for spending an afternoon with me. Can't appreciate or uh, can't thank you enough for coming on. Truly appreciate it, brother. I mean, I think what you're doing is awesome for the field, awesome for the profession. Uh, I think we need to reverse it at some point and put you in the spotlight and ask you some questions, man. I think you have unbelievable insight. I love following you on Twitter. Um, love seeing the different things research wise you put out. Uh, you're definitely thinking at a really fast and next level pace, which is exciting to watch, man. Uh, and like I said, I mean, anytime we get to talk shop and just have fun and talk about how we can make our athletes better, which is what we're all in this for, it's just a blessing. Thanks again. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks so much, Coach. Appreciate it. I want to thank Coach Greg Adamson for coming on the Decoding Excellence show. This has been a fantastic interview, and I thoroughly enjoyed the time that Coach Adamson could spend with me. We discussed everything from education, empowerment, adaptability, entitlement, uh, uh, shaping positive attitudes and how that reflects the leadership. We discussed books, performance technologies, the advent of sports science and what they're doing at University of Tennessee to better equip, prepare, and position the athletes that he works with at a greater chance of not only capturing victories, but also player wellness and player health. Uh, Again, I want to thank Coach Adamson for coming on the Decoding Excellence podcast. And like always, if you've taken anything away from this show, if there's something that really resonated with you, please reach back out to me on social media. I'd love to hear about it. And like always, 
please go into iTunes, subscribe, leave us a review. Good, bad, ugly, doesn't matter. I want to use this information to help impact the lives of the other people and the future coaches to make our industry an even better industry so that that young male or female graduating with an exercise science degree or kinesiology degree entering into this profession, the profession that we're shaping right now, can enter into one that's better equipped, better suited, and can hopefully continue to help pass the baton to these young coaches so they can continue with shaping the lives of our student athletes. And like always, thank you for tuning in to the Decoding Excellence show where we attempt to understand the techniques, tactics, and tools of world-class performers and truly what it takes to decode excellence.